I will say this, that I kind of boiled down the world's problems to an, an issue of, of separateness. You know, I guess the common modern term for this is supremacy. Mm -hmm. The idea that two groups are separate from each other and one has power over the other. I would say that this is, you know, not just a racial issue. It, it creates war when, when one country or one group feels, you know, different than another group and they have power over that group. They're going to and try to enforce it with war. It, it creates gender issues. And it also has an ecological aspect because mm -hmm. when human beings feel that somehow they're separate from the rest of nature, and they have power over nature, then we have the world that we have today. How can we shift this paradigm to, to one where we're all part of a system, a more of a systems theory way of looking at things? We're all in this together. And I realize that conventional schools support the old paradigm because the mm -hmm. teacher is separate from the students. The teacher has power over the students. Whereas at our school, you know, when we have our meeting, it's in a, we're in a circle. And so everybody, everybody is equal and everybody is a part of the school. We don't have that, that supremacy or separateness. And so that, that's really, I think, the biggest benefit that schools like this have to offer the world. Right on. This is the Agentic Schools podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. All right, hello and welcome. I'm here with Mo Zimmerberg of the Tutorial School down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and Mo, I like to start off with um, Tell me a story about a student or maybe a family that that really sucked the marrow out of the uh, out of what you have to offer. Really got great value and 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 plugged in and really took advantage of what you have to offer. Oh, this is going to be like this every time you ask me a question. There's That's okay. A big pause while I try to. I mean, there's so many students. I, I, uh, we had one student who um, was very, very angry, mm. and uh, he was probably on his way to being a spouse abuser because mm. of things he had experienced in his childhood. And when he showed up, he would he would hurt children. He would mm. he would say. He used to hang out in the hallway where, where kids would go by quickly and 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 um, and kind of hide there and stick his leg out to trip them. Mm. Um, and then after a few years, he uh, he said, "I want to graduate." <laughs> <laughs> we all looked at each other and go, "Really?" But uh, you know, the founder of the school, um, who is always willing to give somebody the benefit of the doubt said well write a thesis hmm. and he wrote a thesis and it just it just surprised all of us hmm. that it turns out that the whole time he was at the school he'd been working on his anger issues hmm. and and uh and he and, and he wrote this great thing he said you know everybody has inside of them um a dark hole hmm. and uh he, he talked about how he worked through his anger issues, chopping wood and, uh, and, and talking to people. And, um, you know, he went on, he went on to live a good life. Right on. Hmm. And that's just one. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> There's so, so many kids have come back and told us, you know, uh, my school saved, saved my, your school saved my life. Mm, right on, right on. So now, um, tell us a little bit about the history of the school, because you, 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 it's been around a long time, right? Yeah, the school started in, in around 1982. Mm. There were actually three starts, 81, 82, 83, so uh, 
it's it's a it's a murky starting. Um, but uh, so we just say eighty two. It's the average mm -hmm. of all three. <laughs> yeah. Um, it started uh, not as a democratic school. Hmm. Um, it's it, when it started. It was in the, the founder's uh, living room, mm. and uh, the students were using a correspondence materials called the American School, oh. which is it's, it's, it predates online schooling. You you right. mail them money, they mail you um, textbooks, they mail you tests. You take the test, and you know we would tutor them and, and help them with the test. They'd mail the test to Chicago. And then they would return a grade, um, and they would have a, a diploma. It was an accredited, you know, um, mail order school, basically. Hmm. And um, that went on until 1992. In 1992, we were getting too crowded um, hmm. in Richard's living room. We were really just on top of each other. And uh, there was uh, a lot of kids who wanted to join our school. So we decided it was time to expand. And um, uh, I won't go into the whole, it's, a, it's an interesting story how we got there. Uh -huh. But we ended up um, deciding to become a democratic school. We were very, very much influenced by Summer, Summer Hill and Sudbury Valley School. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember um, I went away for the summer. When I came back, Richard had a whole stack of books from Sudbury Valley and said, Mo, this is what I've been wanting to do my whole life. These, this school is getting kids into college without grades, without transcripts. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we, we, uh, we did two things which made us a democratic school. The first was we made the curriculum optional. Mm -hmm. And the second was we created a school government. Mm, right. Um, the, the, the optional, um, making the curriculum optional, optional um, the end result is nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right. <laughs> not too surprising. And then I made, um, I made a, uh, two tweaks on the Sudbury Valley model. Um, one had to do with uh, the way the meeting ran. We, I decided to that we would uh, run the meeting on consensus. Mm -hmm. And um, th that's also a long conversation because now we have the sociocracy people who have changed all the terminology. But, uh, <laughs> right. we, we do what we call is a relaxed version of formal consensus, ah. which uh, the sociology people call negative consent or consent. So we're actually okay. doing what they do, except we don't go we don't do the circles. That's a really okay. beautiful thing that the sociology people do um, that we don't do. Um, we do more uh, popcorn style, which is mm. you know, whoever has something they want to say can raise their hand and the person running the meeting will, will call on them. Um, and the other tweak we did had to do with the grievance committee. Um, so uh -huh. they, they, the, they call themselves the justice committee at Sudbury Valley. We call ourselves um, the grievance committee. Okay. And um, uh, over the years, things have changed. So I can talk about where things are at right now, which right. is that the, uh, the the grievance committee uses restorative justice, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to Sudbury Valley, which uses a criminal ju uh, criminal justice system. Um, so you're you're found guilty or innocent. If you're guilty, you're given some kind of punishment. Often, right. Right. Um, we're using restorative justice. Um, although, you know, sometimes, you know, there, there will be, uh, you know, sometimes the kid will get kicked out of the school. That's uh, right, right. kind of the ultimate punishment. Right, um, right. <laughs> we have an appeal process. Um, the student can appeal to the all school council. Every, every committee at the school is subservient to the all school council. So any decision mm -hmm. that a committee makes can be appealed to the all school council. Mm hmm so, okay. um, and, and also, um, uh, Sudbury Valley treats, um, uh, the, their justice committee, um, like jury duty. Every single mm. student has to take part. Oh. Um, we don't do that here. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all based on, um, volunteering or right. when the school is small, sometimes, 
um, a little coercion. Like, we really need you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Just in order to make it work, right? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That, that's that's an ongoing theme um, in the in, in the people I've talked to is regardless of what model they may have started out with, um, th- there's always an evolution. There's always uh, uh, ways that they have changed, and sometimes it's a big, you know. You hit 1992, you discover Sudbury, and all of a sudden you make the big change, or it just you know things evolve over time, and that's something I found is very consistent. Um, and even other ones that that have been modeled after Sudbury have done those kinds of tweaks or had, you know, like you're the, the second one who said, you know, we started off with a more Sudbury style and, you know, have evolved towards more uh, restorative justice type of principles and, and mechanisms. So so I think it's really interesting um, that that. You know, and I didn't know that about about Sudbury that it that it has you know that it's like jury duty and it's a requirement. I, I did not realize that. Um, they may have changed. I mean, they've, yeah, yeah, <laughs> they've changed over the years as well. Yeah, yeah, every, yeah. Every that, school, every school is a little different. But I think that's that's one of the things in in the principle. You know, the agentic schools being the 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 idea behind this podcast is part of what I'm realizing and and and, and emphasizing is that is that that the schools themselves are are living evolving entities in some degree and 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 that's a property that's a feature (laughs) it's not a bug you know it's it's something that's actually important to understand about it and and one of the consistent things that i've found is that is that each community has to take it and make it their own um is that the successful ones the ones who've been around for decades like your own uh you know they find that means of sort of who are we in this uh, you know if you claim democratic schools as, as an identity then what does that mean for you it doesn't mean the same thing and it can mean very different things at different times um so so yeah i really appreciate that um you know th- th- that that history and then you know it becomes something that you know whatever it is now <laughs> um so so when you're trying to describe your school to someone who's never, you know, has no clue, <laughs> the random stranger on the street, shall we say, um, how, how do you present it? How do you explain what you do? You know, there's so many ways to describe what we do. So uh, usually I try to get some information to about the person right. I'm talking to. And mm-hmm. then I know, like, what perspective to, uh, you know, what, what, what approach to take. Mm-hmm. So if they're if they're sort of in a typical mainstream school in your area, is that enough information to sort of give you a sense of? No, I mean typically we're talking uh, about a parent, and and typically, okay. uh, I will ask them what their concerns are. Oh, very good. And once I know what their concerns are, then then I know what approach to take. Am I taking a, mm. a psychological approach? Am I taking a more political approach? Am I taking a yeah. you know pedagogical approach? Am I, you know, what, what, there's so many aspects to these kinds of schools mm-hmm. that uh, you, I'm, I'm ruining your question. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, you're, you're adding nuance to what you're saying. You know, and, and I appreciate that. It's, it's something where, you know, I, I'm actually, you know, yeah. I can be a little suspicious if someone answers too readily, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, like they don't th- that part of the emphasis of this early, this first season has been people who've been in it a while. Um, everyone, uh-huh. you know, the schools are all schools that are well established. And so, and so, but that's exactly the point is, is that there's, there is so much nuance to this and it is something people don't have familiarity with. Um, whoops. That's my alarm saying I should talk to you. <laughs> I better turn that sound off, though. Okay. Um, so, so, what is the? Just pick one of those approaches, you know, like the one you sort of like feels okay, like okay. it's more common, like a more you know. Well, and, um, sometimes I'll I'll take how how did we get here, mm. and 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 that that for that approach, then I say, well, um, we, we noticed that the students uh, were under a lot of stress. Mm. an unhealthy amount of stress. And uh, we determined that the, this, a lot of the source of the stress had to do with the unhealthy relationship between the teachers and the students at conventional schools. Mm. And specifically, it was this power differential. 
that created right. this unhealthy relationship. And so we thought, well, let's create a school where the adults and the children who are at the school can relate to each other in a healthy way. Mm. To do that, we had to take away the power differential. And once you take away the power differential, then you can't really have a curriculum because you can't force kids to do things um, that they wouldn't normally do on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, you know, it's impossible to have a curriculum without coercion. Right, right. So, so this is one I always push back on. Um, would it be fair to say that what that that you cannot have an academic curriculum you cannot have a um a, a curriculum could it or, or or maybe put it this way uh would you would it be possible to say that a the social the governance structures that you did use to equalize that power structure to equalize the power um could that be construed as a sort of a different kind of curriculum given that it is something you know they they are they they do have to participate in the governance process and so it is required it is something that you you know they can be kicked out there are things they cannot do and that's defined through the governance would it be fair to say that that's may, maybe say a social curriculum rather than an academic one i mean really it depends on your definition of curriculum <laughs> we're we're going to have to define curriculum and then then i can answer your question because right. you know this is you know so the, yes absolutely the the way i was using curriculum did did mean a set of academic subjects which every student has to um follow exactly exactly so that, that was the definition that i was using certainly yeah. um certainly we do have um and it's really there's only a few really mandatory things mm -hmm. at our school. One is that you have to take part in the school government. You have, you have to help run the school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other is um, we, I have an, or, an orientation seminar. Um, mm -hmm. We were just discussed this last week because I was thinking maybe it's time to drop it. But uh, mm -hmm. the, the students still want it. They still want the orientation seminar. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so uh, that's another mandatory thing. And then um, you, you have to clean up after yourself. Okay. Nice. <laughs> right. Yeah, very cool. So, so that's, a, that's a way to, to – and, and all of those three things apply to the adults as well as the, the kids, right? I mean, it's fairly uniform. Like, like you say, there, there's not a there, – there's an equality in the requirements to set. Is, is that true? You know, we never specified who has to go to the orientation seminar, but every single adult has gone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it, right? it, really, it really never, never came up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There is one, um, in all things, um, uh, power, power is shared. Um, mm -hmm. but, there's, but there's two, there's one place where it's officially not shared. And there's another place where it's unofficially not shared. <laughs> okay. and, and the official place where it's where it's not shared is in hiring and firing. Right. That, okay. that is the purview of the students only. Oh, okay. So at, the, at the end of the year for our last meeting, uh, the the adults leave the room mm. and the students uh, do an evaluation. They give us feedback and they decide if we have a job next year. Okay. And when it comes to hiring and firing, the students have the final say. Cool. So that's that's the official uh, difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then the unofficial thing is that the the person who can craft a better argument usually has more power at the meeting. So yeah. so unfortunate, um, but the adults do tend to be better at crafting arguments. Mm -hmm. So they they we really have to hold ourselves back in order to try to keep things more equal. Right, right. And and that's that speaks to a cultural element in you, within your within that has developed in your school is that you you are uh, maintaining adult presence that is attuned to that 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 realizes oh we have to be responsible as adults 
to be giving them, and this gets to the agency piece that, that is the agentic schools piece, is you're, you're facilitating their agency, therefore you need to be careful with how you use yours. That's right. And you, and you stopped yourself from continuing the sentence with the word giving. Because right, right. That, that is the case. We are not giving them freedom. We are not giving them anything. We are holding ourselves back from curtailing their freedoms. Exactly, exactly. And, that, yeah. and that's a tricky thing to, for, for adults, especially if they're not familiar with the democratic schools and the, how they operate, is that, that they're, when, oftentimes when teachers define their role it's the opposite of that. It's, it's, we, we, we give, we, you know, we're, we're pushing things towards them. Um, and, and like, so it becomes difficult. Yeah. I'd like to take a side, a side mm -hmm. step into terminology. Sure. Um, Sudbury Valley, uh, made a decision to call the, the adults working at the school to call themselves staff. Right. Right. Um, because they wanted to, to, um, uh, emphasize the, uh, the equality um, and de-emphasize the, the teacher aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, we did that for many years and then we worked with a publicist who said that, that the staff, um, denigrates the adults working there. And mm -hmm. so we, we finally, um, chose to use the word faculty. Faculty. Nice. Yeah. So the faculty, um, whatever that means, but right, right, right. <laughs> we, we, we almost chose tutor because we are the tutorial school and right. you know, th there's a college, um, in Santa Fe, St. John's college and the, mm -hmm. the professors there call themselves tutors. Um, right, right. we tried that. It never stuck, but faculty mm -hmm. it seems to be sticking a little better. Right on. Right. And yeah. And I think that, that, you know, playing with a lot of different educational contexts, that is, I, I think that publicist, you know, had a good point is that when people talk about faculty and staff, that is a power, <laughs> there's a power differential there. Professors have a whole different way of being powerful in higher education, and then staff has a different thing going on. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And, and I've also noticed that, you know, a, a lot of schools jettison the idea of teacher, but they'll take on staff or facilitator, or, you know, they have a lot of different ways of, of trying to evoke something different um, than, than just the sort of teacher over student and that being a power differential. So, yeah, yeah that's really interesting. Um, going back to, to talking to people who may not be familiar, what are some of the sort of educational mythologies that you find most, uh, you know, sort of need, in, need to be overcome in order to sort of have parents enroll in your, in your school? Oh well, the biggest one is that that you need um, you need an accredited transcript to get into college. Mm, yeah, yeah. That 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 is absolutely the biggest one. Right on. And how do you address that when that comes up? I tell them it's not true, <laughs> and they just go, "Oh, okay." <laughs> yeah, we, we have we have a thirty you know we have a thirty year history. Yeah, um, yeah. So so you know I can say, look, it's just not true. Mm hmm. So, so yeah, you point to your history and you say, yeah, we've, we've, we've experienced that. We, we have the, you know, the, the, yeah. the our alumni yeah. have never had a problem. There, so. there are exceptions. Um, okay. I, I think you can't get into the army. You'd have to, you'd have to take the oh. GED. Yeah. Um, yeah. for a while, cosmetology school, I don't know if that's still true for a while, auto mechanic mm -hmm. school, but then we got a student who got into an auto mechanic school before he graduated. Hello. <laughs> he works at the school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so in those situations, you just take the GED. Yeah, yeah. Right but, uh, you know, um, it, it, what, one th of the things we – because we have a scholarship in New Mexico. Basically, um, anybody can go to college for free. Oh, okay, cool. In New Mexico, but you have to go right after you graduate. Ah. Uh. And, and, um, you have to, you have to have an accredited diploma for that scholarship. Okay. So we have had students who got like, uh, I, I know a student who got into UNM and then before he, um, before he had took the GED and then he took the GED in order to get the scholarship. Okay. Um, but 
I also have a friend whose daughter was going to another school. She got sick of the school, dropped out, um, took the GED, started doing um, community college, but wasn't ready to commit to four years. Now, the rules on the lottery scholarship, we call it the lottery scholarship because the hmm. money comes from the lottery. Got it. Um, the rules are you have to go right after you graduate high school and you have to go for four years straight. You can't take any breaks. Wow. <laughs> so she wasn't ready for the four-year commitment, so she stopped going to school. She lost her scholarship. Now, we had a student here who gamed the system. She graduated from our school. She wasn't ready to go to college yet. She worked for a year. Then when she was ready to go to college, she took the GED and was able to get the scholarship. Ah, uh, oh, because it was that was considered the moment. Yeah, yeah. She, she gamed the system. So what we tell parents, don't just take the GED as a knee-jerk reaction or as a rites of passage. Yeah. Take the GED if you need to. Yeah, strategically. Yeah. yeah. But when as far as getting into school, it's so easy to go to college in this country. It's so different than a lot of the rest of the world where mm. the, a lot of the nations around the world have a national test. Right. right. And you have, to, you have to do well on the test. And I mean, in India... Um, the grade you get on that test determines which schools you can apply to. Yeah, that's true in China, too. Uh, they're, China's trying to move away from that, but, but it's very difficult. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, but in, but in the U.S., anybody can go to school. They don't, nobody cares. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just have to you know, get over whatever hurdle they put in your way. But it's usually pretty minor and insignificant. <laughs> um, so, so given... Um, you, you, your 30 year history, <laughs> who is it that it is really showing up for you? What are the families like? What are, what kind of, how does that look? Uh, Sorry, I can't make generalizations. It's so okay. different <laughs> and, it's, and it changes. It's changed throughout the years too. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, um, you know we can see trends, but I, I would say by and large, um, th there's no generalization I can make. Mm, it's always okay. a mystery. Who's right. going to show up? Right on, right on. And how big is your school? How, give, give me a little bit of the, the oh, it's, size you know, and location. It's, it's really place. small since the pandemic. There's only been like seven students. Oh, wow. Okay. That's really small. We had the, you know, the, the amount of students here has changed a lot. Um, and it tends to follow the economy. Mm. But, um, you know, we never really recovered from... 2008 the crash i remember right. the crash in 2008 where yeah. one one after another had parents coming in saying i'm sorry i can't i can't pay any tuition mm. um, and and we'll let kids come for free mm. but a lot of times parents won't even knock on the door right uh, because they they have this image that that private school is expensive right we're not going to publicize the fact that we'll let kids come for free mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then, then we'll just get too many kids wanting to come for free. We, we need right. some money to run the school. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we were, we were averaging around 20 um, until the pandemic hit. Mm. And then we lost a lot of kids. You know, we, we lost, uh, we did the, we did the school outside. Oh, okay. Right. And that was lovely, but we took a big break in the winter time. Mm. And we lost a lot of students um, during that winter that we never really, never really recovered from, from that. Um, mm. We lost a lot of kids to jobs because all Which, of a sudden teenagers <laughs> could get jobs. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So it's yeah. a small school now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been small before. Right, we, right. We, you know, the, there was a there was a guy, um, Ed. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on his on his last name, but he used to certify um, schools that were um, that were not conventional. Um, let's see. Oh, right, right. Um, the NCACS, the yeah, National yeah. Coalition of Alternative Community Schools, right. and he had an organization. Um, that accredited schools mm -hmm. and I started, you know, and the school was small at the t one year and I was talking to him about it. Um, and he, and I started coming up with theories for why we were small and he just stopped me and he said, no, schools are 
small all over the country right now and it's the economy mm-hmm. and so i i, I kind of watched and it, we do tend to follow the economy mm-hmm. okay yeah that's interesting and, and a lot sense. to do a lot to do, has to do with how people how families perceive their wealth oh yeah yeah if they feel like they have a little extra money that they can put into private school then they then they'll do that mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, so when when and and you you're you have a campus, right? I mean, you have a, a facility. Yeah, we have two, two and a quarter acres. Two and a quarter acres. Okay. And and what part of Santa Fe? Like, is it middle? Or is it like center of town, or is it rural? What's the character of the area you're in? Well, we used to be the south edge of town, but uh, mm. not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the town the town keeps a you know we're near the hospital what i tell okay. people huh, okay right on um and one one of the things i also like to ask is about uh each school seems to develop certain jargons or code words that are that just are unique to their school what are some of the things that you have that, that might be really cool if other people you know understood them and, and used them okay well um uh, most schools have the concept of tabling uh, when they're at the meeting, um, oh, right. if if you are discussing a topic and you know you're not ready to make a decision, you'll table it until mm-hmm. the next meeting. We have some items that that we want to come up every single week, like the oh. cooking class um, deciding what to cook. That that mm-hmm. decision's made by the by the whole school. Um, we call that a condiment because <laughs> if it's a condiment, it's always on the table. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> and then we have we have things that we put aside um, because we can't make a decision until we have more information. Mm-hmm. And so we're not going to just bring it up at every meeting. We're going to wait until we have the information we need. And so we call that fermenting. Ferment. <laughs> right. So you have condiments and fermenting. Very cool. Yeah. Very so cool. that's that's a, that's a, that's some jargon that we uh, that we came up. Right on. Right on. Yeah, very and then, cool. And then um, I don't know. I mean, the the names of the school, the names of the rooms, you uh-huh. know, are more a physical characteristic, the purple room or the brick room, right? <laughs> you know, because every room is kind of multi-purpose. The big room, uh-huh. right? Right? Yeah, yeah. That that I think that's another common feature of of schools, just more independent schools, is that they tend to have a very flexible use of space. Um, uh, Joyce and I were at uh, Design 39, which is near San Diego. Um, so it's it's a school that, that is kind of in the deeper learning realm. It's not democratic by any means. It's a public school, um, but they're, in, you know, they focus on project-based and things, but, but they were, um, I was, we were talking to the principal, he's showing us around and we're kind of asking about their use of space. And, and one of the things, they wanted more flexibility, but it's really interesting because there's apparently formulas for how they're supposed to use space. And they have a sort of administrative pressure on them to use space in a certain way at a certain density. And, and they keep pushing back against it saying, we, we need this space in order to function the way, you know, in order to do what we do. Um, so, you know, having wide hallways where you can do different things just in the hallway was such a, you know, difficult thing for them is really, it's strange, but but in you know the schools like you know independent schools, schools particularly when the when the democratic power is in place, where where the you know people are making different decisions about how to use space, um, then it just becomes a necessity uh, that you you don't have a fixed function. I mean, other than you know you're, if you have a big commercial kitchen, it's not gonna you know, it's gonna gonna f- function a certain way. You know, there's a limit. Uh, but all the other spaces, you know, if there isn't something that's defining it in that way, then yeah, it has to be flexible. Um, so so are, are the one of the things that that a, a lot of schools um, do like at uh, when I volunteered at Village Free School, they called it certification, um, just being able to do use different things like when you have stuff that might be uh potentially dangerous or controversial um do you have ways that that kids plug in and and like be 
or are they just supervised or how, how does that work when, when like if they wanted to play with knives or something, how would that work? You know, it's, it's, uh, over the years we gravitated towards a more less official way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a kid wants to learn how to chop wood, I'll go out there with them and, and show them how to do it safely. And I'll just observe them for as mm -hmm. long as I feel like I need to, uh, mm -hmm. until I, I feel like they're, they're safe on their own. Right. right. Um, which with chopping wood is a very long time. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you and, can. and and I would say with a chainsaw, um, I probably would have to have a certain amount of confidence in a student before I'd even. But the school doesn't own a chainsaw, so I can say this is, my, this is my chainsaw, you know. Right. <laughs> um, but it's never, it, you know, it's never been an issue. I mean, we could ask Iku about the kitchen. Um, mm. She does the the cooking classes, but mm -hmm. uh, nice. you know it's it's never been an issue where a kid's taken a knife out of the kitchen and and uh, or are and, misusing and it mis in some way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right we on. do have a rule about weapons, um, uh -huh. and we have a definition of a weapon, which mm. is a anything that's used to threaten or intimidate somebody. Oh, okay. Weapon, you know, which which gets a, a, you know gets around this idea of like, well, this is this is just a stick. Or, right. Right. So it's it's yeah. really your, what you do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that and that's that's another thing that I find a a, a lot of um, schools. I mean, there's a constant negotiation around. Um, I mean, just because the kids have different interests, different things going on, is there going to be a negotiation? What can we do? What? How can we do it? You know, and but there's also that sort of. Um, Negotiating what are the potential downsides of, of anything, um, uh, and, and so it's 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 really interesting, like being clear about defining things or defining things in a different way than is typically done, and and it doesn't take on that sort of bureaucratic sense of like we're going to define something forever and and, and be done with it, um, but that it's something that can change and evolve as the situation changes and evolves. Um, yeah, I find I mean, that, we, that... We do, you know, we do have uh, we have all this fencing equipment. Um, mm. So we yeah, we came up with a specific agreement. We don't actually we don't call them rules. We call them agreements. Okay, because what we have is more of a social contract. Yeah, um, nice. So yeah, the the agreement is that you can't really take out the any of the fencing equipment unless it's part of the class. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because then it's. It's by definition there's you know gonna gonna be some kind of structure, formal or not. Uh, you know there's gonna be some kind of structure of how this is gonna work by calling you know because it's a class. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. because they are you know they are dangerous things, foils and epees. Right. Right. That's that's cool. What are some of the other like fencing equipment? You know that's that's interesting. That's first I've heard of heard of one of the schools having that. Um, what what are, are there any other like kind of interesting unique things that you've that your school is is has or does? <laughs> well, we have a lot of jewelry equipment. Oh, fun! For making jewelry, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it's more it's like a Santa Fe thing. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. What. What else? Um, oh, we have a bunch of music equipment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have a, a A to D converter so that somebody re could record music and and, uh, and and transcribe it digitally. Oh, neat! Um, yeah. If they wanted to do some digital processing with it, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a bunch of we have a bunch of sewing stuff. I could tell you. I mean. I, what I more think is what we don't have, which I wish we had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish we had a wood shop. Oh, yeah. Uh, I wish we had a metal forging, you mm -hmm. know, metal working shop. Some, Summer Hill School has yeah. has both, you know, a great wood shop and a great metal shop. And, and uh, but Sand School, had they, you know, they build boats there. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. It's, a, it's incredible. <laughs> uh yeah, well, you go around the world and you look at other schools and you see, oh God, I wish we had that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the unique things about Village Free School right now is that there the space that they moved into a few years ago 
has a bank vault. <laughs> so that became their music room. <laughs> of, course, of course, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's soundproof for interesting reasons. <laughs> And they did have to be careful about the door, uh, you know, how it closes and stuff. But is, yeah. there, is there ventilation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a really big space. It's actually a surprisingly large space. So yeah, it definitely has its own. Do they do they put some up way. some sound, some some echoing um, absorbers? You know, I haven't. I don't remember. I don't remember looking in it close enough to see if that was true. Um, I mean, I, I, I imagine that the echoes. Yeah, yeah, you'd be you'd be really concerned about that. Um, yeah. I, I imagine they must have put something on me, even if it's just soft stuff. Like like my background here is actually many layers of uh, microfiber cloth in addition to the printed thing in the front because it absorbs sound. Uh, and I've got, you know, acoustic tile type foam things on my wall yeah. um, to try. Yeah, we put some know, acoustic, we put some foam wedges in, our, mm -hmm. in, our, in our, the room we use for music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, so, so I'm curious. Oh, so, so one of the things that that I was thinking about when you were talking about sort of the the formal and informal areas where there's, uh, you know, not equality necessarily, is that one of the things that that is often, you know, that there it's kind of evident is that I assume what you're referring to was all the day to day stuff, but then there's some area where you have some legal entity that that is run by the adults basically <laughs> um, actually i i uh, we're a non-profit corporation and i merged the board of directors with the osco council oh fascinating very cool nice so 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 you effectively your all school council is your non-profit board yeah but we just we never i mean i, I did it officially in the school i never got around to changing the uh, bylaws that are registered with the state uh, still, I still have to do do that part of it. I never mm -hmm, got around mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, yeah. I know in uh, the village free school, way Oregon law is structured is that basically they they would have preferred that. So they have what they call their, I think it's their circle meeting, um, but but basically they have kind of the what what most folks call the all school meeting. They call it their circle meeting. And then they have to have just by because of legal requirements uh, a, a board that handles the legal stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's interesting that you know if if you can do it, you know it, it probably varies with state law because uh, that's usually what your corporate body is is registered with. Um, so it'd be interesting if they if if, <laughs> if you can do that. <laughs> I mean, the, the the legal things amount to two things. One is. Uh, registering with the Secretary of State in New Mexico, right. so that's mm -hmm. filling out a form, a form, yeah, and and giving them ten bucks, right. and then there's filing the taxes to right. to the federal government, um, which is done by the treasurer. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two things that the board does, really. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Legally, you know. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, when it comes it's down, it's not to like it. the board is sitting around, you know, discussing the the money. Right, right. Well, that's that's the thing. It's a, yeah, I, <clears throat> that's the thing. It gets tricky. <laughs> if anything comes up, it, then it then you know, like like uh, one of the things that, that the village tree school ran into was uh, around higher uh, any kind of employment issue, something that came up and needed to be negotiated. They couldn't have minors in on those discussions. Um, and it's just some, oh. it may be a quirk of Oregon law, but yeah, but that was something that they had to, had to have a separate thing for, which you could probably just form a committee for, you know, if you need to. Yeah, so. Well, we, we, we ran into a problem with, we used to have a, a materials fund checking account where students were the signers. Okay. And we came into a problem where they changed the rules so that only um, somebody 18 or older could be a signer on a checking account. Yeah, yeah. But we were just about to close it this year, but then we had a student who was 18 who agreed to be a signer. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're going to we're going to keep it we're going to keep it going. Yeah, um, well, you know, as long as we can, but it really yeah, it really did put a hamper on things. Yeah, yeah. This was great because the kids would learn how to run a checking account. They learned how to Exactly. Run 
who's and you know the the students would make decisions on how to spend mm -hmm. the money it was it was a really good thing yeah i remember um when i was um I spent a year teaching psychology at Village Free School uh, some years ago, and um, and just kind of as, as part of that, I I was I spent eight years as the treasurer and co-founder of a, of a local environmental nonprofit. So, literally bookkeeping and doing all the treasury duties was exactly what I did. Um, and so it was, it was interesting. They they had a um, a group of kids who were I'm trying to remember. They were selling something. I just can't remember what, and. And, and, you know, so at some point they had a big sale and, and it, there's multiple kids all handling the cash box. And so when it came down to it and they counted it, you know, uh, you know, basically said, you know, helping them reconcile the book. It's like, there's some money missing. And, and, you know, when you have a bunch of people going in and out of your cash box, what are you, you, know, you going to do? They, they. Learn the hard way that you have to you have to do bookkeeping, <laughs> and so it was a it was an interesting challenge uh, for them to you know realize that, and 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 you know likelihood is that that it was in probably it wasn't a big amount uh, it was a small amount and it was probably just incorrect change given at some point you know nobody I don't think anybody was intending to you know rip them off or anything uh but it but it was an interesting you know lesson in oh yeah you have to you have to keep track of things and you have to have a little bit of control over the money if you're going to keep track of it um <laughs> yeah real real world lessons are are much better learned than anything artificially absolutely and, and and um the other thing we've learned is that the more power the more actual power you give students mm -hmm the more they'll learn from the situation. Yeah. So when you actually give them the power to hire and fire adults, then they, they take it seriously and they really learn and they really grow from the experience. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because that's, that's one area that there is a lot of variability on is that some schools, you know, reserve the right to hire and fire, you know, the adults, um, whereas you've done the opposite and said, you know, we're going to let them handle it. Um, and and then there's a whole learning process that attends that. Uh, so so I think you're right. That's a really important. I, I think I, it's I think... really it's really one of the best things we do because I, mm -hmm. I I've never seen the students stand up taller than after <laughs> they fire a, a teacher. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> you know, that then that it's such a good thing for them, mm. and it also guarantees that I have you know the best um, the best faculty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, so so thinking about the larger context within which, which your school, so you think about New Mexico and probably Santa Fe as a city, um, are there any things that are um, on your radar in terms of, of ways that the state or the city or anybody um, could sort of mess with what you do. Um, anything that you're concerned about, you know, it could be, you know, city regulations or you, know, you said you've got banking regulations that are making it hard to keep kids on the, on the checking account. Are there, are there other things that kind of might be of concern? <laughs> Let me put it this way. This is New Mexico. Mm-hmm. So if somebody decided to be a problem, to create problems, they could create problems for us. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it, my image of so, New Mexico. So in other words, uh, you know, uh, especially in a country like Australia, where they're very focused on the rule of law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the letter of the law, um, in, in New Mexico, it's more based on if somebody complains. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, we, we, we had a lot of problems one year. We had a neighbor complaining about mm -hmm. um, a mural that we had on one of our walls. And, um, you know, the city you know, was coming down on us and it was getting worse and worse until we painted over the mural. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, all those problems went away. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, really, I, and I'm not going to go into you know what are the possible ways somebody could create problems for us. Right. Because, I'm just know. not going to say anything <laughs> about that. Yeah. But of course, it's always that's always a possibility. Somebody could right, create right. problems, um, or they could just leave us alone. Right. Yeah, because I'm uh, my my guests are international. Is that in in some contexts there are some things where there, you know, there's more. You, you know, we don't have a federal system that requires. I mean, the federal government doesn't know anything about your kids about kids, um, but the states know a lot um, and and want to know a lot. It's just they don't always get the freedom to do that. And in other states, like. Uh, you know, in South Africa, all the kids are registered. Uh, and so, you know, there's concerns there. Um, so, so yeah, know, that... um, there was a, there was a, a free school in Santa Fe in the sixties called the Santa Fe community school. Okay. And, and one of the people uh, working at that school was uh, Ed, who we talked about earlier, who used oh, okay. to be accredited schools. Um, I'm, I'm still blanking on his last name, yeah. but um, they, yeah, they, they tried to shut that school down. Mm. And they went to court and they won the court battle. Right. And because of those court battles, New Mexico has very, very liberal laws mm. when it comes to private schools. And basically oh, okay. anybody can call themselves a private school and the state can't tell the private school what to do. They, the, mm. the school gets, as long as they're not doing anything illegal. Right, right, and, sure. And the school basically can do whatever they want. And, yeah. and homeschooling, um, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of homeschooling in New Mexico. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, a lot of parents won't register their kids at home. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, Oregon is pretty, pretty, where I am is, is, is pretty, uh, there's there's some things on the books that just, you know, some requirements that are not enforceable because they don't have budgets to do it. So so in a practical sense, it's not, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Right on. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up. Um so give me one more story, this time about a kid who presented a challenge and, you know, through the process of, of engaging with the school, uh, you know, found something, you know, really came through and, and made the school a better place, perhaps. Oh, um. I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> student, wait, can, can you help me on this? I, 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 a student who created a problem for the school, but then when we worked out the problem, the school became a better place. I'm a story. I'm just to come up with a story about a student who created a problem for the school when they first showed up. But well, through working out the problem, the school became better. So basically, they usually have to go through a grievance process. Mm -hmm. And in the grievance process, um, we work on um, not just the the people involved in in the grievance, Mm -hmm. but two people are like at it, and it really affected the whole group. Um, And it does, it's a small school. So um, we work on, at the end, not just to um, make them realize about each other and and how that happened and why it happened and all those things and, and you know, uh, come up with the old, like, brainstorm and ways to not let that happen with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, when that's kind of like in a good place, it's like, okay, I'll do this when, when I get annoyed. Okay. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll get the cue here, you know, that yeah. kind of way of like, you know, resolving that. But basically it doesn't stop there. The process mm. doesn't stop there. It, it goes into like the whole, whole of the school feels more peaceful, right? Mm. Get that kind of like harmony back in the in the whole school so that would be the next focus for them and all of the people in the grievance committee to to figure out so Mm. what can you do to make other people feel uh safer even though here we figured out something nobody else knows (laughs) Mm. so we have to get other people to know that they're safe too 
so that's the restorative justice part is mm. that at the that's the aim of the whole process is to have the whole whole of the school feel okay mm -hmm. so um usually um when these two people or the group um comes up with with a with a solution we talk about what can we do to to let other people know that that this isn't going to happen and mm. um that it you know everybody's safe feel mm -hmm. safe and we come up with like um involving some people who were not in the, in that grievance to say you know this person needs a cue and if you can be you know part of if everybody knows that this is all in agreement with the person too <laughs> right right is it okay for everybody to give you a cue when something is about to happen like you lose yourself right. and you start doing this thing that you know upsets everybody or upsets especially this person um can all the other person take on that cue and use it to say hey you're doing it like you know like mm. some some <laughs> or you know like something like that to mm -hmm. you know and it, it's an agreement with the person so that the person would say oh yeah that's right i was i'm doing that mm -hmm. i'm doing that right now and so like people are involved in that little part of mm -hmm not having that to happen it um instead of being in the in the grievance for hours and hours to figure that out right 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 so it is all shared knowledge at that point to say okay you know when someone does this <laughs> uh -huh. then we know that you're doing something right. that will upset people and so it's like a shared knowledge to mm -hmm. make things better and it's up to them to take that on mm -hmm. it, it's up to all of us to take that on so it right, doesn't stop right. in just a little dispute between two people mm -hmm. it becomes more of a of a school thing right on yeah and and that's probably the most powerful um situation that that the whole school can be involved in um mm -hmm. that everybody has the same knowledge and um you know ways to you know not have that un uncomfortable screaming happen <laughs> or you know stuff like that mm -hmm. right on <laughs> i can I, that's just came out like the top of my head but yeah there's lots and lots of like you know especially when they're younger kids they uh -huh. and the girls and at their 11 well, it's like they're screaming time. They're mm. screaming like for nothing. They just scream. And it's, <laughs> it's it's so uncomfortable for me too. <laughs> like um, <laughs> the eleven year old scream, and you know when that starts to happen in a small room like the kitchen. Kitchen's not mm. so big here. So when that starts to happen, then you know we can take it so far with that mm -hmm. and then an agreement was created no screaming in the kitchen yeah You're right <laughs> it's, it's, it's intense <laughs> yeah yeah i bet I, I can give you a very specific uh, story of, of one particular student okay um we had a student who had a lot of anger issues mm -hmm. and um uh, in the graduation process we had two main requirements the student had to be okay i'm gonna go Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> um, the the uh, the two main um, graduation requirements. One is that the student has to be aware that they're in charge of their lives, mm. and aware of being responsible for their actions. Mm. And the reason we have the word awareness in there is because we don't expect the students to have completely healed all of their all of their stuff, but just to be aware just to have the awareness and that that's good enough um, to become an adult. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we had a student with really bad anger issues mm -hmm. and and we just couldn't get him to talk about it in his thesis oh, okay which is which is the way people show that's how you show that you're aware of these things by I by see. writing it into their thesis. It's very similar to Sudbury Valley, only mm -hmm. we're we're much more specific in what we're asking for. Um, we, we have a much more detailed graduation process mm -hmm. that, that takes a year um, that I'm, I'm actually kind of proud of. Nice. Um, and we had a student who, you know, just would could not acknowledge his his anger issues. And we had no way, you know, to make him do it. And so after he graduated, you know, we, we all felt a little uncomfortable mm. about him graduating. Um, and so what we did is we changed the graduation requirements. We had a third requir requirement uh -huh. that the, uh, the student needs to be aware of their major emotional issues. Mm. So... And the interesting thing is if you combine the three requirements together with writing the thesis, then the student has to talk about their major issues without right. blaming anybody. Mm. That's what you have to do to graduate. Hmm. And that in that way, the school became a better place because yep. of a, a student who created a challenge. Yeah. To yeah. Specifically answer your question. You know, yeah. um, I know you want to wrap up. There's so much <laughs> more that I could talk with. The school has been going for so many years. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. I will say this, um, uh -huh. uh, that I kind of boiled down the world's problems to an, an issue of, of separateness. And, um, you know, I guess the common modern term for this is supremacy. Mm -hmm. The idea that two groups are separate from each other and one has power over the other. And um, I, I would say that this is, you know, not just a racial issue. Um, it, it creates war when, when one country or one group feels, you know, different than another group and they have power over that group. They're going to try to enforce it with war. Um, it, it creates gender issues. Um, and, and it also has an ecological aspect because mm. when human beings feel that somehow they're separate from the rest of nature and they have power over nature, then, then we have the world that we have today. So, so to shift, how can we shift this paradigm to, to one where we're all part of a system, a more of a systems theory way of looking at things. We're all in this together. Um, and I realize that conventional schools um, support the old paradigm because the mm -hmm. teacher is separate from the students. The teacher has power over the students. Whereas at our school, um, you know, when we have our meeting, it's in a, we're in a circle. Mm -hmm. And so everybody, everybody is equal and everybody is a part of the school. We don't have that, that supremacy or separateness. And so that, that's really, I think, the biggest benefit that schools like this have to offer the world right on yeah that's an excellent way of putting it um sort of in in yeah putting that paradigm ideal uh, at, you know supremacy being the summation of it <laughs> um because you anytime you put that power over dynamic in place regardless of what context it's in it creates challenges um yeah yeah, that's a good way to put it. So before we actually do sign off, um, what are the ways that they, that folks who are listening could uh, uh, find you, find out more about you, uh, that sort of thing? Well, we have a we have a website, um, and that is uh, tutorialschool.org. Mm -hmm. That one word, tutorial school. Okay. And, um, you know, the, there's an email address on the website. You, you can email the school, and I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer your questions. Fabulous. Thank you, Mo. I much appreciate it. And uh, we will call that it. Okay.